It's Red Eye Radio. Gary McNamara and Eric Harley talk about everything from politics to social issues and news of the day. Whether you're up late or you're just starting your day, welcome to the show from the Uniden America Studios. This is Red Eye Radio. Hello and welcome. He is Gary McNamara. I'm Eric Harley. And now that all of America knows what it's like to have to work in the dark, even for four minutes. Yeah, we survived. You're welcome. We yeah, survived. We did. We did. All right. The, I, um, the world is still here. I slept for a few hours, and then I woke up, and just me and my dog, Bella, hanging out in the house. And it started, you know, to happen slowly, and you could kind of see, I was watching on my security cameras, you could kind of see the shade, right? The sun was changing, and it was kind of interesting watching it on the cameras. And then as we got close to go time, <laughs> one forty, our time, um, man, it just went beer lights out. Yeah. It went, yeah, it, it I, I went outside and in fact, uh, uh, I wasn't in the best mood yesterday. I finished up my taxes. Yeah. So, all right. Owed more than I thought. Yeah. Well, it happens. And we've talked about that in the past that, uh, mm-hmm. When uh, Republicans lowered taxes a few years ago, <laughs> our taxes went up. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Ted Cruz. Still <laughs> not doing it on a postcard, dude. <laughs> <laughs> and as I've always said, if my taxes go up when Republicans cut taxes, yeah. I don't want to know what happens when the Democrats raise taxes. Well, it had me wondering if I should move to California. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah, you'd love that 13% <laughs> state income tax, uh-huh. all right. Yeah, right. Yeah. My right. my percentage went up. Yeah. My percentage of what uh, I pay in taxes mm-hmm. went up. Right. Your bracket. You went my, up another bracket. My, I went up. Yeah, talk about brackets that you don't want to deal with. Yeah. That was a bracket. Yeah. So, yeah, I went up uh, a few percentage. I think I went up three percentage points. Mm-hmm. And what I pay in, uh, yeah, in in, in tax. It's I'll say this: it's the most I've ever paid in taxes. When I saw the mm. amount, I went, "You've got to be kidding me!" Yeah, I was like, oh my God. yeah, I got a a hefty bill. I'm going to be uh, <laughs> doing a uh, an album with Will and Nelson and trying to raise the money. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, it was it was pretty cool. Oh, though. oh, oh! But I assume my taxes. I finished. Yeah, and then and then it was like, oh, what's the time? And I went out, I put on my glasses, mm-hmm. and it was the first time I put on the, well, the second time I put on the glasses. I tried them earlier in the house. You can't see anything. It's pure black. Yeah. I mean, it's just not, and then you, you go, well, this thing's, this isn't going to work. And then I looked up and I went, oh my God. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I was like that Janet on Friends. Yeah. Except, you know, with the. Yeah. That, was it Janice or Janet? Yeah, one of went, them. Oh yeah. my God! Mm-hmm. Uh, I looked. It, that was unbelievable. I mean, it really was. I'd never seen an eclipse before ever. And when I looked up, the detail that you could see in it is what really blew me away. Um, and it was uh, it was great watching it for probably a half hour. When I got out, it was already you know, 25% into the sun Mm -hmm. and it was still a half hour at least. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so my neighbors were out and I think the most wonderful thing is as soon as you got totality, you could hear the cheering from my subdivision from distant streets. Oh, it was really cool. Applauding the moon for doing its job. Yeah. All right. right. But I mean, it was, uh, it It was pretty cool. It was, um, you know, it was, uh, I, I, when people say it was a spiritual moment, you know, I understand, you know, you know, how many times I see yesterday, the sun sets every day and it's always, we know, but you don't get a chance to see uh, a moon uh, going in front of a sun like that. Right. And he just, you don't get to see it. We see the sun every day. This is, well, and it's like, but I thought it was, it was actually, it was spiritual. Uh, yeah, it, it really was, was. It was cool. Um, it was uh, interesting. I, my neighbors from across the street uh, were out there with their grandkids Um they have uh, some very good trees, <laughs> so they come across the street uh, and sit on the sidewalk and uh, were out there. They were out there quite a while, actually, 
uh, I'd say at least an hour. I noticed them at least an hour before. And then they were out there after just, you know, they had their glasses on looking up and, you know, I don't know what comments they were making. I didn't, I didn't go outside. I, I wasn't being too social. I was pretty tired. And so, um, but I went out back with my dog, Bella, and uh, we looked up. Uh, she laid down. I was, remember, experts say, monitor your pets. And she was like, I guess this means we can't play Frisbee, right? So we hung out for a few minutes, uh, took a couple of pictures, and went back inside. It was really, it was really cool. I think about the times when there was no predictive measure, right? Mm -hmm. And you're out there, you know, you don't even have to go back to ancient times. Just go back, you know, whatever, uh, a couple hundred years, whatever. Uh, and all of a sudden you're outside and then it just goes dark for four minutes and you look up and there's, and the center of the sun is just black. You've got to be freaking out at that moment. And then it all comes back. You're thinking, what just happened? You know? Um, but it, it is pretty cool. It's a, you know, it's a once in a lifetime event, uh, for a lot of people. And then I saw the stories cause I was watching, uh, text dot the, uh, Texas Department of Transportation cameras, mm -hmm. right? And as soon as I woke up, uh, I, I thought, let me log on and see what's going on. Okay, nothing going on. Then I saw some stories came up in my news feed, local stories, uh, well, from regional stories, I'd say, down in the hill country of Texas where a lot of the smaller uh, Airbnbs and bed and breakfasts said, it didn't turn out the way we thought it was going to. We thought it was going to be jam-packed, and this past weekend was not what they thought. So then I'm thinking, okay, but there will be the return home. And then the story started coming out of the traffic of, you know, people basically going back home that had entered into the uh, zone of totality. And that was the case. A lot of it northeast of here. I didn't see locally. I didn't pay attention. I, I don't know at all what it was like in the afternoon afterward because by 2.30, 3 o'clock, I was asleep again. So, um, yeah, it was pretty cool, though. Um, it was a pretty yeah, interesting, was, you know, event. It, I, it's one that you really do or you should take the time for. My lovely wife, unfortunately, got caught on a business call, couldn't go outside. It was, you know, just one of those things. Business doesn't stop, you know. And so uh, people had to, you know, a lot of people had to stay in their offices, but you know, just what you got to do. It got me thinking uh, just of the, the, the physics of it all. Mm -hmm. You know, when you actually look at the physics of, of gravity, and uh, I was a couple of years ago I was watching some documentary that said if the moon wasn't there, our planet wouldn't be here. Yeah, right. That it would just be that the moon is what keeps us, you know, in balance, and it's the gravitational movement. And I mm -hmm. started uh, thinking yesterday, well, let me read more on gravity. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I went all the way back and, you know, Sir Isaac Newton. And you know where the word gravity comes from? Mm -hmm. Gravitas. Weight. Yeah, yeah. That's where the word comes from. Yeah. I think uh, I because that. I was like, okay, well, give me. And then went into then uh, went into then and how Einstein viewed gravity and mm. you know how uh, you know gravity just holds everything together and and uh, just uh, did a, a little uh, physics lesson yesterday so that was also uh, really cool but looking at the glasses and seeing that move across and how crystal clear it was and your phone camera most phone cameras couldn't get you know just didn't get even when it was totality. You just can't get what you can quickly see with the eyes. Mm -hmm. You know, when you just glance up very quick. Well, you have to put it into pro mode. You have to balance it. And yeah. a, the cameras, if you know how to use them, if if you're just looking at a quick shot, it's not going to take a good shot. So you have to know how to basically adjust your camera to do that. That takes a minute to do. So the pro, mode could, have have, the pro mode could have done it? Uh, yes, but you're going to okay. have to balance, you know, again... Uh, your focus manually and, and everything else. And and it was a learning process for me, but there's not enough time to do it in that four minute. I don't believe in that four minute time span for the average person. You'd we, have to, yeah, we have the same phone. Just yeah. Yeah. So uh, I didn't have any problems 
uh, getting any shots of it. But the problem is, is you don't have enough time to play with those modes with a pro mode in in those cameras in order to get it right for that moment of where you are, your own perspective of where you are. So uh, the focus becomes, it is interesting taking shots of the moon at night. It used to be just a blur on my old phone, on my old camera. And now you can get these great shots of the moon. I'm fascinated with it, um, the moon in general. I always have been. I think most people are. It's interesting to me watching the moon close up at night um, and watching the tides. We were on the beach um, in July and watching, you know, the tides, you know, change. And we had some very high tides at the time we were there. You'd get up in the morning and the water line was so far up the beach and it was crazy. And you think about that. I mean, you just think about it just makes you feel like a blip, you know. It's that insignificant feeling that, you know, that <laughs> there's a lot more to this whole thing than, yeah, than when just you, you. When you actually experience tides and realize it comes from the gravity of the moon, mm-hmm. as, especially if you live on the coast and see mm-hmm. it, that's always, I always thought that was really intense. And it was, yeah. it was just interesting, you know, when you get into the Einstein stuff, of uh, of the physics of of gravity and the mm-hmm. warp, uh, you know the uh, basically between was it uh, the uh, time and uh, what is it the warp between time, uh, how he explains gravity that mm-hmm. has to do with uh, the fact that light bends around the sun, right. and so right. the, you know talking about how the gravity force is actually made, which gets beyond. It's it's like when we talked to that uh, astronomer one time. When I said, do you guys really understand this? I mean, can you process this in your brain, you know, time warps and things like that? And 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 uh, he said, no. Well, then how do you know all this happens? And he says, simply mathematics. And that's mm-hmm. a fascinating thing of being able to take mathematics, understanding the math of it, which then gets you to a conclusion that your mind really can't process. Right, yeah. You know, because I don't well, think... Well, you think about how when we launch anything into space, where we launch it from matters. Um, and yeah. the the shape of the earth that it's actually not round it's not flat it's actually not round it's kind of oval and so you look at it and <laughs> the fact that it's it has that bulge in the center and there is that you know that back and forth which is what the you know what's happening with the tides and why we launch where we launch from into space all of that is <laughs> I've been following since I was a kid. I still haven't completely wrapped my tiny brain around. So I can't imagine if you're doing that for a living, if you're an actual scientist. It's just fascinating to me. Um, And now when the asteroid finally is on its way, you know, and Billy Bob Thornton's crew has done all they can do, uh, Aerosmith's daughter is crying, you know, it's oh, good. yeah. I'm thinking mm. the other movie. Yeah. Oh, you're the one with Frodo? No, no, mm. the one where he's is that the one with Frodo where he's Rocket Man? Remember he builds a rocket in his own house. Oh, that's the uh, the the farmer that yeah, the, the, farmer, the farmer astronaut. One. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, farmer astronaut. <laughs> that's what yeah, I would thought. Yeah. I thought you were talking about that. No. <laughs> no, I I was talking when he was a real astronaut. <laughs> Armageddon. <laughs> yeah. With Aerosmith's daughter. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Aerosmith's daughter and uh and Matt Damon's uh heterosexual life partner, uh, Ben Affleck, it's, it's, <laughs> it's going to be a different feeling, you know, cause this time we you know, Hey, it's over in four minutes and then it's going to really be over then. Um, it's interesting because someone, someone said they're within, I forget who it was. They were quoted in the story that were within a few years of being able to really do that, to go up and redirect, you know, a, a giant asteroid heading, Heading for Earth, and I thought, okay, yeah, they keep changing things, though. You know how they they come out with, "Hey, wine's good for you." Hey, wine gives you cancer. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't trust anything. Uh, you know, the science community is is always back and forth. You know, the fact that um, Stephen Hawking was wrong about the black his black hole theory for what thirty years. If that guy can be wrong, <laughs> I don't trust anything. And, but I, but it's still fascinating. And I just wonder about the people long before we had, 
anything close to what we have in, in predictive technology or ability. Just being out there, well, just imagine if you were out there plowing a field today and it was, you know, 1885 and all of a sudden it goes dark for four minutes. Well, I was thinking that today. I went, oh, now I know how, then one of the thoughts went through my mind. Now I know how Neanderthal man found religion. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you see that the first time you're like, right. What in the world is that? There are greater forces. Yeah. Well, you yeah. think about it. I mean, with the technology we have today, mm-hmm. you know, people from 150 years ago would look and go, oh, that's magic. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, I think that's I think that's it. I think, you know, uh, those of us who do believe you look at at God's work. I mean, going to mountains, going to the Grand Canyon, seeing all these things or, you know, looking at things that are just majestic. And then seeing something like we saw yesterday, you know, it's like, wow. What it, remi- what it reminded me of was um, when I first stood at the Johnston Observatory outside at, at the northern side of Mount St. Helens, where you can mm. see the entire cra- you know, crater just, yeah. the entire mountain blown right off. Right. And you look into the crater yeah. and you're very high up yourself and you're looking into it and you just, you turn and look and you're like, you know, it's like, whoa. Yeah. And that was, and I thought about that. I went, wow, it was sort of the same. There's like a spiritual moment of like. You just feel this, so small. Yeah. This is just so incredibly, right. you know, big. Yeah. And so it was really, I didn't expect it. I didn't, I didn't expect it to be as cool as it was. I was just busy in the day and it's like, oh, okay, time to do it. Put the glasses on, you know, looking around. I go, oh, I can see, well, and I took a picture of it first and look, I go, yeah. oh, there's nothing there on my camera. Mm. Put the glasses on, looked up and went, oh my God. Yeah. Because it was that, it was, yeah. that, to me, it was that impressive to yeah. see that. Yeah, it was. Eight six six ninety red eye This report is brought to you by Shell Rotella. With advanced synthetic technology, is designed to help keep your rig running with more mileage and less maintenance. Cold weather takes a toll on trucks. As warmer weather rolls in, it's time to assess the impact winter has had on your vehicle before you find yourself stranded roadside this spring. Begin your spring maintenance routine by inspecting your brake system and listen closely for any air leaks. During winter, water and moisture that builds up in your air brake system almost always freezes and turns to ice, which can damage your air valves, air dryers, and other essential components. Check and drain your air tanks to help keep water, contaminants, and corrosion at bay. Also, check your slack adjusters for proper stroke and lubrication. And check your brake lining or pads to ensure proper thickness. Get in touch with Red Eye Radio, toll free at 866-90-RED-EYE. In Twitter Radio, he is Eric Hurley, and I'm Gary McNamara. Coming up on the uh, show today, Biden and uh, student loan transfer. It's not forgiveness. Stop it. You're transferring it to someone else. Look, we've talked about this for the uh, the longest time, and nobody's ever had an argument against what we have stated. No. Never. No. No, we had a couple of people that called and, and argued in their own interest. Right. Or their family members' interest. But as we have said uh, the the first thing is, why do they lie about it? Why do they say it's student loan forgiveness? Why don't they say it's student loan transfer? Right. And what's behind the student loan transfer is people who did not sign a contract to take out the loan are more responsible to pay off the loan than you are. Yeah. Who took out the loan. Right. If it applies to colleges, what else should it apply to? Right. It's simply what you see is the selfishness of people that want what they want when they can get it, however they can get it. And Biden's attempting to buy votes by doing something that's illegal. And what he's trying to do is get it done as quickly as possible before the courts can come in and the loans are already forgiven. Right. Yep. That's the plan. Yep. But it's pure selfishness and political greed from this administration.
You're listening to Red Eye Radio from the Uniden America Studios. It's Red Eye Radio. He's Eric Carlin. I'm Gary McNamara. All right. I got to play this audio. All right. It's The View yesterday. Okay. I'm going to go down the hall. <laughs> Could you see if there's a beer left in the refrigerator? Well, I'm going to find one. <laughs> Here we go. Let's All right. play The View on the eclipse. Fine. What's crazy is with the earthquake on Friday and then the eclipse today, People are having all sorts of conspiracies about the end of the world. And then I read online that the earthquake epicenter was actually at Bedminster in New Jersey. Right. Fun fact. I, so it originated with Trump. I, have to say, I, I know, right? I mean, I have to say, um, Karen Dupich, our, our wonderful, oh one of our gosh. wonderful makeup artist, when the earthquake was happening, she put her coat on and she was like, Jesus is coming. I'm so out. I'm, I'm out. I'm leaving. We've got a solar eclipse. Uh, we've she got the earthquake. The she ran down the hallway. The and rapture then, is here. The rapture is here. And then all also, I learned that the cicadas are coming. Cicadas. Cicadas. Oh, for the, the first time in cicada. like no, 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 two different, no, two, no, well, they, this is what I there's read. Two, two different there's times. two different kinds of cicadas. Yes, two different times, times are coming. The good cicadas but, right, and the bad cicadas. But no. for the first time in, in many, many years. No, and seven, so, every 17 years this happens. Well, that's not what I read, but maybe, <laughs> but, you know, maybe well, you know better. I, but in I a way. I say all those, all those things together would maybe lead one to believe that, you know, either climate change exists That's or something point. is really or the going is returning. Not. Earthquakes are not at the mercy of... I'm the sober one? Is that what you're trying to tell me? Well, as I've said, the view never fails to give the impression, the wrong stereotypical impression, that women are emotional nightmares who have no critical thinking skills at all. Cicadas, sunny Austin, cicadas, the earthquake, the eclipse has something to do with climate change. And I'm telling you, it is the worst promotion of women out there, of the incorrect stereotype of women. It's almost as if they went out and said, let's find women that are the biggest idiots ever known to mankind and put them on TV. Uh -huh. And then claim these are the average women that exist. Those aren't women that I know that I deal with. It's not the critical thinking skills that I see in the women that I know. Yeah. But they give the worst wrong stereotype of women being completely clueless, ignorant, emotional, with no critical thinking skills to connect the dots. You know, <laughs> again, before things like science, I could see hundreds of years ago when people went outside and all of a sudden it went dark for four minutes, people freaking out a little bit. The earth is going to end. And then you have a sunny afternoon for the rest of the afternoon and go, okay, it's fine. As long as it doesn't do that repeatedly, I guess we're good. We seem somehow to make it. We seem to deal with it. You know, in the past, there were, it's not like this is the first big natural event to happen on Earth. We seem to make it through the other ones. And it's like now the more information we have available, the more idiots we have. Yeah. And it's never been easier to find the answer right look it is cool it will make you feel small looking at the solar eclipse yeah it will make it will put things in perspective again you can you can see this when you go to any kind of majestic scenery or environment where oh my gosh you know uh the spanish peaks in colorado driving through them you know you you drive on top of a we we drove to the top of this one mountain and we're above ten thousand feet. You get out and you can't breathe. I mean, you're struggling to breathe. Now we're staying at eighty five hundred feet where we were. We get out of this little lake and it's like, 
There's not a fish in there that's worth it. I got to breathe. We got to (laughs) go. But you look at these things and you look at these, you know, you look at this unbelievable planet, universe, and yeah, you're in awe. This, you know, putting all this together, you, I, again, jokingly, if you're saying, oh my gosh, there's a lot going on here, I could see where people hundreds of years ago would freak out in a year like this. But we're not freaking out, are we? Yeah, we are on the view. On the view, yeah, just just uh, amazing. I, I like somebody had the mean yesterday. It was like eclipse, tornadoes, yeah, <laughs> hail, yeah, lightning, mm-hmm. thunder, f- uh, flash flood warnings. Eh, it's Monday in Texas. Exactly. <laughs> oh my gosh! Uh, hold on a second. They, who was it? Was it Dan McLaughlin? Over the weekend, oh my gosh, he had the funniest post. A National Review? Uh, yeah, it was on his own uh, page on X. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, here, here, here it is. Oh, good. I have it on good authority. This is from uh, April 5th. I have it on the Dan McLaughlin. I have it on good authority that the earthquake was caused by climate change vaccines white supremacy, the deep state, and divine wrath, but mostly by net neutrality repeal. <laughs> <laughs> and then somebody came back and in the, in the uh, comments and commented, and the Mets, and he commented on that and said, no, the Mets can't make anything happen, <laughs> which was brilliant. It was so funny. I laughed hard at that. Um, look, it's, uh, it's okay to have fun with it. Going into freak out mode, you know. By the way, uh, anytime is always a good time for prayer. But this nonsense on the view, you know, that's not what I read. That's not what I read. Okay. All right. Way to source it. No wonder they have lawyers sitting right there. <laughs> we can't find anything of this. We can't find anything on this. Well, I just, like I said, the for, for me, it's... Uh, they're not women that I know. No. They're not, I they, don't know they, they, any women I don't like know that. Any women like that that and as I've said, when you when you see the fact that they are so and I'll I'll let me, let me get the correct phrase for this, uh ignorantly irresponsible for the things that they say, but they don't even know half the things that they say, whether they're true or not. And right. that's why they apparently right. have lawyers on retainer. Right. Because they can't think about that. You and I have been, we've, it's, you know, 40 years. Yeah. Each. We, we've, each, we've been in, in radio. Mm-hmm. And could you imagine if you had, <laughs> and companies and owners come to you and say, all right, go on the radio, open your mouth. <laughs> and, right. And it's like, Okay, but you know there's a great responsibility when you do that. Right. And we've always viewed it as a great responsibility. And so we don't want to peddle false information. And if we ever, if there's ever a mistake out there, we never knowingly do it. If we do and somebody brings it up, we're the first ones. We don't hide it. We go, oop, okay, we just got this information. You know, what we stated before was uh, was wrong. Right. It was the last yeah. thing that we would ever want to do. right. right. We don't want to waste. I don't want to waste my time. You don't want to waste your time talking about things that aren't true. Right. It's a waste of time. Yeah, I, I don't need to do that. Right. And so, but when I see that, I'm just like, I don't know women like this. The women I the no. the women that I know, um, are all biological women, <laughs> and they're they're great critical thinkers. They can connect the dots, and that's why every time I watch the View, I just shake my head. I go. You cannot, you know, we talk about, you know, the uh, the NCAA women's, you know, basketball and, yeah. you know, all the, the, the hype of it. it was wonderful to watch. Mm-hmm. You know, they, have, they play great basketball, these top teams, and, and they, they did great. And I saw it was 18, over 18 million watched the, their game. Yeah. Extremely entertaining. And, you know, you go from that and you hear these 
you know, young women talking, and you're like, you're quite impressed by it. Oh yeah. When you see yeah, the yeah. press conferences, you're quite impressed by it. Like, wow, yeah. that's you know, maybe we're not, maybe we're not all doomed. Right. Well, that kind and, of discipline, you know, it's right. not just the natural talent; it's the discipline to develop and maintain that talent right. to work with others. And you, when you hear them talk, it's like, my gosh. Right. Now, we're talking about the players. We're not talking right. about, for example, Don Staley, the coach, right. who uh, didn't have the guts because you see everybody coming out yesterday saying she doesn't believe that. No. She doesn't yeah. believe that yeah. men should be competing yeah. uh, you know, against, uh, against women. But right. uh, then you go to the view and you look at it and you're just like, these, forget, the, forget the sex. Mm. As humans, they're just ignorantly irresponsible and completely clueless. Yeah. And just to think about that, they've got lawyers that are paying attention to the show all the time to, to make sure that when they make the mistake that they can have that disclaimer ready during the next break. Yeah. But the worst stereotype uh, of women come from The View. It really does. No, I agree. In my opinion. I agree. It's just, it's horrible. And um, and I, I'm assuming the majority of their audience is women. Yeah, I get. I yeah, I think so. I'm going to I guess. Mean, I haven't looked at yeah. the demos, but I'm I'm guessing. But yeah, just God, the eclipse is because of climate yeah. change. Yeah, Jesus. Yeah, God, just yeah, and the cicadas. Yeah, cicadas. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Oh man, oh man! I just had cicada, a... cicada. Yeah, no, it I, doesn't I, work that way. We weren't originally going to go that way, but I when I heard the audio cut at the bottom of the hour, I'm like, okay. Well, it's I just, can't. It's just, it's just, uh, it's so mind boggling how they have an audience. I know. Is it the train wreck <laughs> effect? Are I mean, people now tuning in to see what they'll say? I don't know. What stupid thing will they say today? Right. How ignorant can they be? Right. By the way, hmm. uh, ignorant and arrogant. Yeah. Those aren't two qualities that you want. I don't know what I'm talking about, but I'm extremely aggressive in promoting it. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's not what I read. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Maybe you should do a little homework before. Well, I'm going to do some right. reading here, the Babylon Bee, and then come back with the truth. <laughs> I'm going to go to that one part of YouTube, you know? <laughs> <laughs> the Chupacabra is <Well>, real. <laughs> <laughs> oh uh, Bigfoot, Loch Ness. You know what I hate? I went to YouTube yesterday. There's these, they're all men, and they have like whiny voices, and they do like. Uh, you know, they just analyze stuff. And you're like, you yeah. hear like the first, there's a guy analyzing Seinfeld. And yeah. then then in the sixth season, I don't think that it was, it's like, finally after about two minutes, I went, shut up, it's a comedy. Right. It's like this intense investigation into the comedic humor and did it live to the standard in the sixth season, the seventh season, the eighth oh season, gosh. the ninth season. And I'm like, shut up. Yeah. By the way, we've already judged that. The audience was there for it. Exactly. Period. Right. It's just, you know, it's already happened. We already laughed. Move on. And they have these, like, it's all guys with whiny voices. Yeah, exactly. 866-90-RED-EYE. We'll be right back with more Red Eye Radio with Eric Harley and Gary McNamara. It's Red Eye Radio. He's Eric Harley, and I'm Gary McNamara. Uh, coming up, Donald Trump and uh, abortion and his uh, statement uh, yesterday. We'll get to uh, that. Hmm. The National Association of Intercollegiate, uh, Intercollegiate Athletics has banned uh, biological men from women's sports. The NAIA, as it's called, yeah. mostly smaller colleges, and now there's the effort for the uh, NCAA. Uh, we'll see where that goes. Also, uh, Riley Gaines speaking on Don Staley and I, I, uh, yes, or, uh, Don Staley's comments over the weekend supporting biological men playing against biological women in basketball. It's funny because I did a Google search. She hasn't said anything since. 
And it's like anybody who has commented on it in the basketball world or the or college athletics has said she doesn't believe that. You she, could you could hear it in the way she delivered the answer. She didn't she's she wasn't believing what she was saying. I was thinking if I was a player for her. And yeah. all the talk about women and women and then for right. my coach to go up there. Yeah. And basically, you know, betray us and Raleigh Gaines was talking about whether it was, you know, those that have already played, uh, Megan Rapino, mm-hmm. uh, you know, Sue Bird from the WNBA, yeah. Don Staley. Their careers are over. Right. They're they, retired. They yep. would have never made anything if men competed against them. Right. And they're throwing the generations that come after them under the bus. Right. What do the players feel? Yeah. Top of the Hour News is brought to you by House Products. Visit HouseProducts.com. This is Red Eye Radio on Westwood One. Now, it's Red Eye Radio. Gary McNamara and Eric Harley talk about everything from politics to social issues and news of the day. Whether you're up late or you're just starting your day, welcome to the show from the Uniden America Studios. This is Red Eye Radio. All across America and around the planet, he is uh, he's Eric Carly and I'm Gary McNamara. We're Red Eye Radio. My mind is working faster than my mouth. Did you get a beer out of the refrigerator for us? I got coffee. Oh, okay. It's crap. Maybe I'll have a coffee. Okay. Caffeine's allowed. Alcohol isn't. Yeah. <laughs> Darn. I'm starting to wonder how much of this I want to be awake for. <laughs> <laughs> starting to question my coffee decision in general. <laughs> yeah, it might be too late for me to have coffee. Uh, it stays in your system for like four or five hours, so. I yeah, don't know. maybe 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 I'll have a water. Who knows? We'll we'll figure out something. All right. So yesterday, uh, uh, Trump made the uh, his statement on abortion. Mm-hmm. Uh, let the state basically let the states deal with it. Yeah. Now, politically, first let's hit politically on it. Politically, can he get away with doing that? Can Trump get away with simply saying, because what he's saying is now it's not an issue. Hmm. This goes to the states. The states decide through the through through the, uh, the the people. Now, I did see yesterday some people were saying, "Well, that's what conservatives have always wanted." Not necessarily. Uh, it's always been, if Roe v. Wade was overturned, it would go back to the states if Congress didn't pass a law on it, mm-hmm. because the odds of Congress passing a law isn't very likely. Either way. Mm-hmm. You know, it's going to be it would be very tough to get it would be very tough to get a law through the Senate that you could get the 60 votes to either uh, hypothetically limit uh, abortion to 15 weeks or the other way, abortion till birth that Democrats want. And so it's uh, I believe, you know, it was calculated move by Trump, which was, look, uh, we need to win. Mm hmm. We need to win. We can't win this right now. As we have stated, one of the things that has happened over the last few years, probably over the last decade, is a changing of public opinion. Most people now do not want, the majority of the people do not want abortion till birth. That has taken one of the biggest arguments, as we have stated many times before, from The women who say it's my body, I can do whatever I want with it, which has been one of the major arguments, right, of Mm -hmm. it's my body, stay out of it. Mm -hmm. And we've talked about the number of uh, women that I've talked to that have made that point to me. And then I've said, well, then you believe abortion till birth? Well, no. Well, then it's not about your body anymore. And they look at me like, what? I go, well, you just said... I go, when would you limit abortion? And they have different answers. Uh, And, but it's all, it's all at 
a designated time in the pregnancy. Mm-hmm. Well, it's like, well, then, no, you believe then at some point the fetus becomes a human being. And one thing that I know that I instantaneously recognized a few years back is the movement is happening. Now the debate is when is it a human life? That's what the majority of Americans are concerned with, even women. Right. When And every single, again, it's anecdotal, but every single woman that I've talked to who brought it up to me, I don't like walk into a place and say, hey, you're a woman, let's start talking abortion. Mm. It came up normally when somebody found out, you know, that we're talking, oh, yeah, he's a talk show host, whatever. And that was the first question after the Dodds de- decision I would get wherever I would go. Right. You know, what do you think about this? And uh, you, that is a that is a great, great point, starting point, or uh, maybe it's not a starting point, but it's a great point to be at because it takes the arguments of abortion away from the pro-choice side because the majority of Americans believe that sometime during the pregnancy, the fetus becomes a human being. So the whole point now is when does it become a human being? That favors, in my humble opinion, the pro-life movement uh, from now until the end. Yeah. Because it's not the debate anymore about it's a woman's body. It's not a debate about personal autonomy. The debate has become when does human life begin? Now, the other thing that I heard yesterday from a number of people, especially on social media, well, you know, uh, it has to go back to the states because Congress couldn't pass a law because the Constitution doesn't specifically talk about abortion. That's untrue. Congress could pass a law tomorrow, and Congress could pass a law stating that we believe life begins at this point. Mm -hmm. And therefore, uh, abortion at this point, that would pass, that that would pass, uh, uh, well, it would pass uh, this Supreme Court, but it actually, forget about the politics of the Supreme Court, the, they would they would be able to do that because the problem with abortion is nobody is set when life begins. Everybody has a different point on right. that. They right. will all, and that's why you can't get a consensus in Congress and you're not right. going to get that 60 votes in the Senate. You're not going to get it either way for either, either side. Mm-hmm. And so for Trump, Trump, Trump is somebody that in regular times, I don't know if anybody could pull that off. But Trump can simply say from now on, look, I've talked, you know, I've I've uh, I've talked about it already. This isn't up to me. It's up to the states and what they want to do. Yep. Because Congress right. isn't getting it done. They won't get it right. done. They can't get it done. Right. That's really the only answer. Right. And, and he can make the point. States are getting it done one way or another. Right. But the states are getting it done. It's where we are now. And if at some point, I don't think it's going to be in our lifetime, but if at some point there seemed to be a consensus, a consensus building framework for a consensus on Capitol Hill, then you could say, okay, maybe Congress will get it done. I don't see that happening in our lifetime. No, neither do I. And it's neither. because of the, you know, it's it's because of the decades-long debate that I don't know will ever be solved, that you'll ever get to a point of consensus through representatives. I I just don't think that's going to happen. I just don't. On the, on the federal level, uh, on the federal level. Right. right. Yeah. But but the movement is the movement slowly because it was a big, it's a big point when you see the majority of people, in fact, the majority of women don't believe that abortion till birth, you know, is moral Mm -hmm. well in that point then everybody's thinking when does life begin the majority of americans believe it begins sometime in pregnancy it's just when is that point Mm -hmm. and so if you sit there and you're screaming at somebody who believes it begins at conception versus somebody who believes it begins at 18 weeks you're simply talking about a different time span inside the womb right 
and that makes a huge difference and favors long term the pro life movement as we find out as technology you know uh, part of the reason that it's moved a little bit is because of things like sonograms and mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you can actually see you know what's going on inside of the womb mm-hmm. and so um you know trump doing it smart political move you know you talk you know pence you know he betrayed you know the whole pro life uh, uh movement coming from pence well if you can't win it in congress and if you promote the daylights out of it and lose the democrats have a stronger chance to open up abortion more in the future look it's a crap shoot either way well and it is the you know one of the strategies that that trump has had throughout 2016 during his presidency and during 2020 and now in 24 uh i don't know if it's as prevalent as a strategy as it has been in the past, but to simply acknowledge something, and that's what you're doing. You're acknowledging, he's really, if you think about it, acknowledging that right now it's in the hands of the states. That's where we are. It's not going to get done on Capitol Hill. And and you could, from either side, say, okay, if, if, if Trump wanted to go 100% pro-life and say, no, all we're going to push for all abortions to be outlawed everywhere. You're not going to win that one. Um, the Democrats, look at how many Democrats are pro-abortion till birth. Yeah, the majority. You know, and I wonder what about their rank and file? Because they, you know, think about this. It is changing, and I wonder, and and, and maybe we'll be able to, you know, again, uh, put some more, add some more to it after November 5th, and, and, and we see how people vote. But the abortion thing for now is kind of, is at the state level. It's, that's, and it's not going anywhere. It's not going to change. There's not going to be a federal move on it. And you may have, you're going to have lawsuits against states that are more restrictive, um, that's, that's the nature of how it's going to work. But frankly, you're not going to have any move on an abortion law on Capitol Hill in our lifetime. And, and politically, frankly, it's the only move Trump could have. I mean, there, there really isn't because there's not a winning move other than that. You're just saying you're basically acknowledging it's in the hands of the States. It should be left up to the States that that's where it is now. And you don't have to go any further on it. You're not going to win the abortion debate. You can win evangelicals. You can win, you know, I mean, the left can win maybe, I don't know how much of their party rank and file if they wanted to push for late-term abortions. But the fact of the matter is you're not going to win. There's not going to be an overall win uh, for either side in this back and forth. Um I believe life begins at conception. I don't know what, where the percentage is, you know, of, of Americans these days. I don't know how many, again, Democrats believe, yeah, abortions, but limited only up until whatever. And vote on other issues and allow that to, you know, be the, you know, the case where their party is, they have supported widely late term abortions. I don't know. It's it's really hard because when you break it down, just like the debates you've had with people in person, it sounds like from their original stance that therefore abortion till birth until you pose that to them. And then they reconsider and they say, well, no, I'm not. OK, then you believe there should be a limit. That is to say, somebody else would make that decision by law. The governing body would make that decision by law. And that's this is all of this why we won't see it in our lifetime on the federal level. It's not going to happen. Just not going to happen. 
because the debate is evolving. And I'm hopeful that we get to a point where the the debate is irrelevant because the number of abortions, you know, drops dramatically and is non-existent and people are choosing to go a different route. They're choosing well, to abstain or whatever it might be. I was re- reading this. This is actually from the National Institutes of Health, mm. from the government. Mm. Uh, peer-reviewed journals in the biological and life sciences literature have published articles that represent the biological view that human life begins at fertilization, called the fertilization view. Mm. As those statements are typically offered without explanation or citation, the fertilization view seems to be uncontested by the editors, reviewers, and authors who contribute to scientific journals. However, Americans are split about whether fertilization view is a philosophical or religious belief. 45% uh, uh, are, are, are split. 45% philosophical, biological, and scientific fact. 46%. 38% of Americans view fertilization as a starting point of human, human life. Biologist, in, in a poll that was done, the National Institutes of Health from 1,058 academic institutions around the world asserted survey items when life begins, and overall, 96% affirmed the fertilization view. Hmm. Well, when that's out there, I mean, that slowly is out, things like that is out there year after year after year after year as a discussion has, has gone. The debate is completely different now. You right. could not have right. had the debate on late-term abortion in the 70s as you're having it right now and win that. Right. Right. Yeah, no, it's evolving. And that's why I think you're you're not going to get to a point of consensus in our lifetime on a federal level on Capitol Hill. It's just not going to – I don't see that happening. 866-90-RED-EYE. Brought to you by FPPF. Fuel Power Max. Owner operators with authority generally have two options when it comes to sourcing freight. Brokers on the spot market or directly from the source, the shipper. As any trucker with relatively recent experience with spot freight knows, the highs of working the load boards can be really high. On the other side of that coin, however, when the market flips in favor of shippers, it can be tough to keep your business afloat working with brokers. The smallest carriers with direct customers, however, can hang on through tough times or even prosper as long as demand for their customer's product remains at least somewhat stable. Owner-operators in it for the long haul make direct business with customers a principal goal. Owner-operator business 101 is provided by Overdrive's Partners in Business program. Go to overdriveonline.com to the Partners in Business section of the website for more detail on this and many other topics. Brought to you by Shell Rotella. With advanced synthetic technology is designed to help keep your rig running with more mileage and less maintenance. Coming up, more with Gary McNamara and Eric Harley. It's Red Eye Radio. It's Red Eye Radio. He's Eric Carley, and I'm Gary McNamara. Now, expect the media to be never-ending, and that's the only question that they will ask Trump between now and Election Day. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's it, you know, And but it's easily dismissed. It, it doesn't really go anywhere anymore because, again, you you can't debate the fact that right now it's in the hands of the state. You know, I mean, the states, they're – going to deal with it for now and Mm -hmm. that's likely not going to change for a long time right and if he comes back and says because what i saw in the statement is he keeps saying the will of the people the will of the people the will Mm -hmm. of the people the will which is by the way a very good thing i mean that does that does blunt uh anything that the democrats do because i think do think the trump campaign should talk about the fact that they accuse me of this Mm mm-hmm I believe the people should decide. I believe the people should decide. Right. When I explain, you know, when I first started with every single pro-choice woman that I met who threw the argument initially at me about, well, it's my body and I can do what I want. And the next question was, oh, so you believe in abortion till birth? And none of them did. And so we took that argument, uh, 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 you know, uh, out of it. And when you take that argument out of it, 
you you can make I, I believe you can make serious headway at that point L- long term I mean I'm talking 50 years from now because it's not going to change in the next couple of years right it just it just it, it it won't and so for Trump to come out and and, and say look um uh, I'm the one that believes in democracy I'm the one that believes the people should decide you know if you're going to have that conversation the judges decided not the people people decide these things when life begins you know this is up to the people to decide and the states are going to do it right now Joe Biden is the one that believes that he should dictate to Americans what the law is I don't right And he is Eric Hurley, and I'm Gary McNamara. We'll tell you about the college association that uh, bans trans athletes from uh, women's sports uh, coming up here in just a little bit, and where will that go? Also, uh, Riley Gaines speaking uh, uh, yesterday concerning uh, Dawn Staley's comments, the coach of South Carolina that won the women's national championship. Congrats, uh, UConn, uh, for the men winning last night. Mm-hmm. Um uh, but, uh, you know, her in the, one of the most bizarre moments I've ever seen because just of her hesitation to answer the question that she believes that uh, that uh, trans females, biological males, should play against biological females in basketball. I just wondered how, when she went back to the locker room, <laughs> what the players were talking about at that point. Yeah. But Raleigh Gaines makes the point that none of them would have ever been in the position they are in today if they would have played against biological males. None right. of them. Right. Whether it's Sue Bird talking about it or Megan Rapino or Don Staley, none of them would have found the success that they have found if they competed against biological males. It would have never happened. Well, we asked it we asked the question when Megan Rapino was talking about it. Said, Yeah, you're on your way out the door. Yep. What about the other players? How do they feel? And I was waiting for that question. Over well, I've been waiting for that question over and over again. Anybody asking the team members, the players, how they feel about this? Now we do know there is intimidation. We know this. We know how it works. Riley Gaines certainly knows how it works. And they force you into answering something where you go, "Oh yeah, no, I'd be fine with it." Let's take a poll. Let's see how many athletes actually would be for it and they're not going to do that no they're not so we'll have that uh, coming up here in a little bit i do want to play this audio here all right because this is if you were listening and we got a lot of comments but we when when this goes back maybe 10 days ago when president biden basically uh when the we we abstained from the u.n vote that uh, and and did not say that any type of ceasefire is conditional on bringing the hostages home. And when we abstained from that, we just you know, we sort of lost it. I know I did because I was just infuriated because I've never seen since I've been covering politics of an American president completely abandoning, betraying American hostages that are being held over there. Something uh, that the United States, you know, has really never done. Not to the extent of not caring about the hostages. And we've said the pattern of not caring about American soldiers in Afghanistan, not caring about the allies who helped us lying to the American people about what the generals told him uh, in Afghanistan, claiming that he cares about Americans during COVID yet leaves the southern border open. Mm -hmm. All these things that he he does that are just so reprehensible 
that he really doesn't care about it. But the fact of abandoning the hostages, and this was last Friday, and this is one of the most liberal people we know, Andrew Cuomo. Andrew Cuomo. Chris Cuomo. Chris Cuomo. Jeez, Andrew Cuomo. Good God. Well, both still two of the most liberal people we know. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah. But Chris Cuomo on News Nation. I want to play it because, uh, uh, again, uh, he's talking kindly to the administration about the error of their ways, uh, but he makes the same points that we did. Let's play part of it here. Here we go. I know that people in the White House monitor what I say. Good. And because President Biden and Secretary of State Blinken won't come on the show, I am forced to speak at you rather than to you. This is not my choice. I understand Talk to people within your party at very high levels, elected and unelected, all the time. I know that the war in the Middle East is a major concern for you in the election. And I think that explains why you misplayed it the way you did today. Okay? You gave a mixed message. You talked tough, what sounded like a threat to your main ally in the region, and then you said you're giving them more weapons. You're treating the war against Israel as if it were another political point of compromise. This is wrong, but this is wrong, and we need to do better here, and there has to be change, and blah, 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 ceasefire. A lot of words, a lot of conditional language, a lot of half-speak, a lot of appeasement in a situation that is not about balance. It is about realities. And I get the pressure from the left. I get it. And I get how tight the race is. And I get how worried you are that you're not going to have the same base you had the last time. But that is not an excuse to be weak. There is a primary reality, okay? And we seem to have forgotten it. Hamas is a terror organization. You designated them as that. They stole people. They need to give the people they stole back to us to Israel first. The hostages have become an afterthought. And that is wrong. And the reason it has happened is even more wrong. The reason it has happened is because other political exigencies and agendas have overtaken their relevance. The aid workers being hit, horrible. Matters, of course. Deserves attention, absolutely. But also makes the lack of attention to the hostages apparent. Hitting the aid workers, angels among us, is, of course, unacceptable. Everybody knows that. It also must be explained. And you should have called for that explanation today, because you know they already know the reason. This is a very sophisticated organization at the IDF. How can you focus on the aid workers who bravely took the risk to be there? Angels among us. That's why... I and the team are willing to risk going there to see their work in action so people can see the need. But if you're going to say that what happened to them demands action, how do you not start with the return of the hostages as the most wrongfully injured victims in the entire situation? Every time you speak about what must happen and you do not begin with, hey, terrorists, give back who you stole, you are giving terrorists a pass. Every time you don't start there, you lose the Israeli ear. Now, if Hamas gives back the hostages, which you would likely require as a sine qua non, without this, nothing, in any other situation, certainly if it were you in Israel's position, then you have leverage. You have a basis for an exchange of wants. Not stop cease fire, expose yourself, and then we hope to get the hostages back. You wouldn't do that. You're asking Israel to do what you never would. And I don't know who else has. I just want to stop it here. He's wrong there. He is doing it. Biden is, he said Biden would never, you know, we would never, something that we would never do if we were in that situation that Israel is in. But he is doing it. He is forgetting about the hostage. They're American hostages. They're not just Israeli hostages. He is doing it, Chris. 
He, he, you're he, saying he, he would showed, do it. He's doing it. He didn't show any regard for American lives in Afghanistan. No. And let's play a little bit more of it. Here we go. Pulling back, under threat, existential threat, meaning they want you exterminated. And, by the way, you don't get your people back first. And it does feed the idea. I know you hear this, especially you, Tony. And I know I hear it because I know who's talked to you about it. That it feeds this malignancy that Jews are treated differently. That Hamas is given more of a break than your main ally. Why even mention ceasefire before they give back the hostages? Now, there's an obvious reason. Too much death in Gaza. Too many innocents dying in Gaza. Children dying, starving in Gaza. You are right. We must all agree. But what has the best chance of motivating a mitigation? Threats to Israel? Never. Political pressure on Bibi? He loves it. All the more reason to force the main want. Get the hostages back. You know what response I get to this? <sighs> yeah, you know, but Hamas, you know, they don't want to give them back. You know, they're bad guys. They need the leverage. Really? So instead, you want to force Israel to relent. Imagine how much stronger the message to Bibi would be if you came in saying, we told Hamas they have until X to hand over the hostages or else. And when they do, you need to do X, Y, and Z. The people in Gaza are calling for the release of the hostages more vehemently than you are. They know Hamas has put them in this hell. What do you know? And then you have a basis for telling Israel there has to be change. Otherwise, you're basically asking Israel to give Hamas the win and withdraw. It will not happen. There you go. Chris Cuomo. See, the left even knows. Those are the points that we made when we were infuriated a few weeks back and then infuriated again last week when the same thing happened. They don't care about the hostages. Chris, that's what you have to understand. They don't care about the American hostages. They don't care about the people in the United States. They don't care about the border. Well, he's talking to them like they're not seeing something. Yes. He's talking to them like they're missing something, and he can point to it and show them something. Yeah. Good point. They're not missing anything. What you're missing, Chris, is the fact that they have no regard for American lives or innocence. They don't. They don't. Everything is a power grab. What will get me power? What do I believe will get me power and control? That's what they care about. That's it. He doesn't care about United States citizens' lives. He's got the far left screaming pro-Hamas, death to Israel, death to America. I'm Man, just, he's got to win, see? He's got yeah. to appease them. He's not trying to appease anybody else. And you're not going to show him anything, Chris. But the left knows. That's Chris Cuomo. He's left. And he knows. It's horrible. They don't even mention the hostages. Think about that. Think about, you know, the, the Iranian uh, hostage crisis. If just... Carter never mentioned the hostages. It right. wasn't even right. a point of discussion. And the media right. went along with it. Right. Let's just not mention the hostages. Right. Let's attack the Republicans if they do. Right. Because we're trying to get peace and we'll focus on the destruction. And that's the thing that even Chris Cuomo recognizes. There is no moral equivalency between the terrorists and our ally, another Western democracy, not even the same type of societies at all. No, and if he doesn't see that, look, Chris Cuomo seems to believe he can talk some sense into this administration. They know exactly what they're doing and what's going on. They don't care, and you can't make them. 866 red eye Lines open for your calls. 866-90-RED-EYE on Red Eye Radio. Yeah, 
It's Friday Radio. Here's Eric Carly, and uh, I'm Gary McNamara. Good morning. Thanks for being here. There's an article written in the L.A. Times about why are people leaving California? It was hilarious. <laughs> I, 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 start, I read that. I was reading that in our pre-show meeting, and then I just by accident I came upon uh, an op-ed piece in the in the uh, Wall Street Journal that actually <laughs> made fun of the original article in the L.A. Times. Mm. The one thing that was interesting in the L.A. Times article about you know how they could keep people in L.A. free college for everybody. So spend more money that yeah. you don't have. Right. I mean, it's just it's just it's just bonkers. And the excuses that that this columnist gives for people leaving California is uh, is quite uh, humorous. So we will get to uh, that. Uh, tell you about the college association that has banned biological men mm. from playing biological women. The NAIA, uh, which uh, of course is mostly smaller colleges. But we'll see what happens with the NC, you know, the whole NC, the whole NCAA, and mm-hmm. whether they decide to change or not. This thing's not going to. This thing's not going to end, though. They're no, pushing as no. hard as they ever can. You see, for example, uh, Don Staley from South, the head coach of South Carolina, one probably one of the best college ba- women's college basketball teams of all times. Yeah, with that, with that record, yeah. I mean, just yeah. undefeated the entire season, and for her, and you could tell. You could tell she was hemming and hawing. She did not want to answer that question. But when she said biological men should play against biological women, that just set off a firestorm. Yep. Because it's like after all this promotion of finally the country is paying attention to great women in sports, you come out and say, and men ought to take it over. Yeah. (laughs) My God. Bad timing. This is Red Eye Radio on Westwood One. Now, it's Red Eye Radio. Gary McNamara and Eric Harley talk about everything from politics to social issues and news of the day. Whether you're up late or you're just starting your day, welcome to the show from the Uniden America Studios. This is Red Eye Radio. All across the USA and around the world, we are Red Eye Radio. He is Eric Harley, and I'm Gary McNamara. Good morning. Here we are. To a Tuesday. Uh, The athletic body for small colleges announced yesterday it will prohibit uh, biological men from competing in women's sports. A unanimous 20 to nothing decision. Mm-hmm. The Council of Presidents of the National Association of Intercollegiate Athletics, NAIA, approved a policy to make the female division exclusive to those who were assigned female at birth. Uh, The decision followed a December survey that showed widespread support for preventing male intrusion into the women's category. Of the 68 schools that gave import, 58 demanded this new policy. The NAIA oversees the athletics of 249 mostly small colleges across the country uh that don't fall into the NCAA's three competition divisions. We know there are a lot of different opinions out there, said the president, Jim Carr, told CBS Sports, for us we believed our first responsibility was to create fairness and competition in the NAIA. We also think it aligns with the reasons that Title IX was passed. No blank, Sherlock. <laughs> It's like they're having it's like they're actually discovering Title IX for the first time in some cases. I mean there would be a good poll. <laughs> ask the ask the question. What's what's the basis of Title IX? Just the simple question, see how many people could answer it. I, I just saw this here. We also think it aligns with the reasons Title IX was created. You're allowed to have separate but equal opportunities for women to compete. I can see now that's the new 
would be the new uh, uh, narrative from the left. Mm. Well, you guys want separate but equal. We want everybody to play sports together. That's right. <laughs> uh huh. All sports should be co ed. Let's go. I'm still not going to make the team, so it doesn't matter to me. <laughs> <laughs> y'all do what y'all want to do. Wow. In its policy, the NAIA avoided the common cop-out of other national sports governing bodies to restrict hormone levels of male participants mm. in an attempt to level the playing field. The NAIA outright disqualifies men from women's sports regardless of testosterone suppression, as they should. Right. It also bars biological women who have started masculinizing hormone therapy from entering the female division. Yeah, you can't do... Right. You can't do drugs. Right. Uh, in stark contrast to the NAIA approach, the NCAA in 2022 deferred to individual sports to set their own transgender rules. Hmm. A group of female athletes in March sued the NCAA for allowing men into their sex-specific sports and private spaces. Yeah, you sue over Title IX. Mm -hmm. Because Title IX is about biological females. Everybody knows it. Yep. And remember, who was the first one to change that? Obama. Obama. Remember, the smartest president we've ever had. Mm -hmm. I think biological males should use the restrooms of biological females because I am President Obama and I am better than you. <laughs> yep. I, I was going to say more intelligent. I like better. That was that was more snarky and it sarcastic. Pretty much, uh, but, it covers everything, yeah. <laughs> well, uh, that was, and they said it. This is our interpretation of Title IX. Right. Which is to say, we don't care about Title IX. Your officer, my interpretation of the speed limit is. <laughs> now, listen to this. This is a lie from the NCAA. Mm. College sports are a premier stage for women's sports in America, and the NCAA will continue to promote Title IX. No, they're not. No. Make unprecedented investments in women's sports and ensure fair competition for all student athletes in NCAA championships. That's a lie. Yeah, they're not doing that. You're not following Title IX. No. You're following a warped interpretation, a completely bizarre world interpretation of Title IX. Right. But when Title IX was passed, nobody was talking about that it wasn't about biological sex. No one. Zero. Wow. Change the definitions, and then you can say, oh, no, no, no. Yeah, just change the definition. If you change the definition of words, you can make anything fit. Square peg, round hole. I like this here. The task force spent nearly two years reviewing research. You don't need to do any of that. Research. (laughs) Reviewing research, meeting with experts to better understand Uh potential policy challenges and obtaining feedback from multiple membership groups. Uh Uh-huh. Look, you can play whatever biological sex you are. But I can't make the team. Welcome to the real world. Yeah. Get in line. I can only make the women's team. Right. Well, I don't care. You don't get to play with the women. Right. We needed to do intense research into this. and We spent a lot of time, like, as if it makes them better people. Yeah. We we did our research. We We grappled. Yes. And then we came across the ancient scrolls, something saying title IX. We we were unsure. We think those are Roman numerals on the scrolls. Think about this. Obama grappled. Remember, he grappled with gay marriage, but but magically turning title nine from biological males. Yeah. You know, uh, you know, from uh, that from biological females to biological males who 
believe they're females. Right. Now, he didn't grapple over that at all. Grappled right. over gay marriage. Remember, he grappled. Right. He was grappling. Yeah. I don't really don't know. I mean, uh, gay marriage, I don't know. I grapple. Shut up your line. You were always for gay marriage. Yeah. Have the guts. Have the Why doesn't the left have the guts of their convictions? Why do they lie about everything? If you believe it, why don't you promote it? And by the way, they always said that outside of his presence, like he was in some kind of secret room, a grappling room, like there was a, a dedicated grappling room built specifically for him at the White House. He's in the grappling room. We're not going to talk about it. He's, just, he's grappling right and, now. And do you see it? Here, I, here's picture Obama. There he is. He has his hand like right here yes. on his head. And yeah, it's, it's like the he's elbows, in the thinking man the, the, pose. The, the elbows on the table. Yeah, and his heads are like I'm. I'm pondering. I'm grappling over this because I care. Because I'm better than you, and I can virtue signal. So I need the proper virtue signaling imagery of the hand or the fingers on the the fingers on the forehead. Yeah, the with the man. elbow touching the table there. Mm -hmm. As I grapple over these, you know, these incredibly uh, complicated issues out there. Like, should biological males play against biological females? Yes. I'm. Uh, let me grapple. Give me time to grapple. I'm in the grappling room. Can't you see that? And remember, Obama was the first major Democrat in that interview to say that race is a social construct, mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. That race, you can be whatever race you want to be. Right. Obama said that. Yep. We have long memories here on Red Eye. Yep. We do not live in the bubble of today. No, we don't. We do remember what they have said in the past, but imagine telling it to somebody because you know people forget it. I got to make sure I find somebody and tell that to the. Well, you know, it was Obama said this? No, he didn't. I can imagine the reaction. He never said that. Yeah, he did. Well, no, that's the problem of living in the bubble of today. You got to step outside the grappling room, you know, <laughs> and outside the bubble of today. I like that. Let's step outside the gra. <laughs> yeah, I don't need to grapple. I don't need to grapple. <laughs> the grappling room. <laughs> There's no grappling. I don't need to grapple over this. No, I, I live in the no grapple zone. <laughs> Caution. You've entered the no grapple zone. <laughs> yeah, I don't need it. Uh, pretty clear. It's been clear for a long time. But it becomes unclear when you start changing the definition of words does and but it, it it comes down you know we we have a supreme court justice who doesn't know the definition of a woman yeah which we said and nobody could ever disagree with us on it they never did that she should have been viewed at that point as unqualified to be a supreme court justice right because if she cannot identify if she does not know what a woman is how can she uh rule on any issue concerning women's rights. Right. If she cannot tell you what a woman is. Right. And we said she should be disqualified right there. Yep. They should have somebody, some Republicans should have said that. Excuse me, if you can't identify what a woman is, how can you? And nobody ever asked this question. This is where the Republicans failed miserably in that one. Mm -hmm. You can't answer what a woman is. Right. How can you rule on any woman's rights issue if you don't even know what a woman is? Right. And we said at the time, she should be disqualified. She should not be a Supreme Court justice because now we believe, here's the thing. Oh, come on, you guys. You know she can, she can she knows what a woman is. You guys know that. Oh, fine. Then she disqualified again for lying under oath. Right. One way or the other. She's either lying or yeah. she doesn't know. Right. And when you change the definition of a woman which is what was necessary, then you can say, well, yeah, this is Title IX because that's a woman. But that's not a woman. Yeah, it is. Simply because they say so. The thing that bothers me the most out of this, so is what you saw, the intimidation of, you know, Riley Gaines and the other women, this intimidation, the threats, the bullying. Right, right. I mean, it's the misogyny behind this, the women hatred that the Democratic Party Alone, because they own this. Yeah. Look, uh, look at the equity bill. 99.9% .9 of Democrats voted for it. They voted for all of this. Yep. They want this. 
And I think one of the questions that women have to ask, why do Democrats hate women? Right. And I don't mean from the, you know, they go, well, uh, Trump hates. No, I'm talking about policy. Right. And things that actually happen that they are on record voting for. Mm -hmm. Not taking somebody's uh, speech out of context. Right. You know, (laughs) this is what they believe and they are proud of believing it. And you didn't see, you didn't see Democrats come out and say this bullying and intimidation of women athletes is just this sexism, this misogyny, this hatred of women has to stop because that's what it's based on. There's a horrible hatred of women in the radical transgender movement of biological women. Mm -hmm. It's a hatred to intimidate them. To make them conform to the will of the man. You want sexism? This is sexism and misogyny that I haven't seen in my lifetime. Well, it will destroy women's rights forever. Yeah, as we stated many years ago. Because we haven't been on this just for the last year. We've been on this for <laughs> since you remember and I the first been bath- One of the first bathroom cases in schools in California. Years ago. And the feedback was, you you guys are taking this way too far. There was no way it wasn't going to end here. There's no way it, was going, it wasn't going to get to this point. And, and quite frankly, it's not over. Remember the Charlotte Observer editorial? Yeah. Uh, women are just going to have to get, girls are going to have to get used to male genitalia. Your daughter needs room. to get used to male genitalia. Yeah. yeah. This is the insanity out there. Right. And if your son who was underage, doesn't want his genitalia, then he should have the right to mutilate it. That's what the left believes. Charlotte Observer editorial board didn't write that. I took that on and planted that squarely on the far left, and that's what they believe. They believe if your child wants to have surgery to mutilate their genitals and you disagree, you're an abusive parent. Far beyond radical. I know. And it's across the board. 866-90-RED-EYE. Get in touch with Red Eye Radio, toll free at 866-90-RED-EYE. It's Red Eye Radio. He's Eric Carney, and I'm Gary McNamara. So, yeah, the NAIA has said no biological males playing female sports. Uh, Riley Gaines uh, was on Fox and Friends uh, yesterday talking about Don Staley, the coach mm. of uh, the South Carolina women's team and the national champions, uh, and about her uh, and her <laughs> question and answer <laughs> and then follow up yeah. on whether transgender, uh, w- whether. Uh, biological men should play against biological females, and she said yes. And when you looked at how she hemmed and hawed and hesitated, it's like, does she really believe it? Here's part of the discussion yesterday with Riley Gaines on Fox. Now, Riley, Dawn Staley, the point guard, do you think that she'd want to play against men? Does she really believe what she's saying? It's okay for a transgender athlete to play against her, her women? Of course, I don't think she believes this. And look, I love and respect Dawn Staley. Two championships in three years. And in three years at South Carolina, she's won two championships. I think her record is 109 and three. That's unprecedented. So, so clearly she's great at what she does and she's developed many incredible athletes whom I admire, but she's either proven yourself to your point to be entirely incompetent or a sellout. And personally, I don't, I don't think she believes what she said. Uh, if you watch the video, her silence, the hesitation and that, that drink of water, I think it spoke volumes. I think she knew she had to be politically correct, and I know about as good as anyone that that pressure exists, and it's real. But the bottom line is she knows perfectly well that men's basketball, it's a totally different sport than women's basketball. 
that's obvious by the speed of the game, the size of the ball, the sheer amount of, of layups in women's basketball compared to dunks when a player gets a fast break in men's basketball, the distance of the three-point line, the list goes on. So what I think this boils down to is she didn't have the courage to stand with women. It was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for her, and she blew it. And, and truthfully, my guess is she's okay with it until her yeah. team defeated by one or more men playing on the opposite team. People should understand that uh, Leah Thomas, when he declared himself a man, was, at, was a Division I swimmer, but not great. He became a dominant woman swimmer. If there's a Division I player at the end of the UConn men's bench and he plays for the UConn Huskies women's team, they win the national championship by 20. Imagine in her day, Brian, right, if, if Carl Malone or David Robinson woke up one morning and said, I feel like a woman today. We would have no idea who Don Staley is. It's always funny to me how these things become okay to those um, who it has no influence upon. Don knows sure and well that she would never be a Hall of Famer if she played against men, period. So it's irresponsible and unfair for her and other retire retired female players like Sue Bird, Megan Rapino, Billie Jean King, and all sports to conveniently say they're now okay with this because what they're doing is pulling up the ladder behind them. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Uh, we talked about this. I mean, imagine that any of these dominant male players just decided for whatever reason they wanted to play women's sports. Think about this. The coach of one of the best women's major college basketball programs ever mm -hmm. is afraid to publicly say that biological women should play against biological women in basketball. Right. Bizarre. I did. to Red Eye Radio from the Uniden America Studios. And he's Eric Curley and I'm Gary McNamara. Wow. This story is just this. There's, every story, it seems like, it's just like, ah, hmm. <laughs> delusional, delusional, delusional. St. Louis has had one of the highest violent crime rates in the country, and while some might say that the city's elected leadership should be held accountable, St. Louis Democratic Mayor uh, Tashara Jones recently suggested that instead uh, the, the city should hold business owners accountable for crimes committed on their premises. Well, we're making progress, aren't we? Jones made the comments during the Memphis meeting of the Black Mayor's Coalition on Crime, which wrapped up March 28th. The discussions during this conference were closed to the media, but an interview regarding what strategies were being discussed, Jones told WMC-TV that we have a lot of violence around convenience stores and gas stations, so how can we hold these business owners accountable and also bring down crime? Some of the things uh, are we are already doing, we're finding other mayors are doing as well. In addition to the novel proposition that it's important to hold business owners rather than the city government officials accountable for <laughs> crimes on business properties, other, <laughs> I just read that. Other uh, 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 meeting uh, 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 attendees suggested that the problem isn't that crime is rising, but merely that people perceive crime is rising. We need to quit telling them crime is rising, and therefore, crime will go down. Quit talking about it, and it won't be a thing. Said uh, Memphis Mayor Paul Young. Said we are solidified and resolved in the fact that. Uh, we are stronger together. The national crime data may show some decreases in overall crime stats. But what we discussed today is that if people don't feel safe, then the statistics don't matter. In a point of fact, the statistics suggest that crime in Memphis has gotten considerably worse in recent years, not better. As noted by WMC, the Memphis Shelby Crimes Commission noted that overall crime, property crime, and violent crime all saw significant increases in 2023 compared to 2022. 
Uh, well, we talked about this, too, how they're looking at the overall statistics and saying, well, these crimes are down nationwide. We're not talking nationwide. We're talking specifically about the cities that have enacted policies that make crime worse. Right. Well, this, That's what we're talking about. This idea, defund the police and go after the business owners who are often the victims of the crime. That'll show them, huh? Yeah, I don't know how you do you're that. In, you're insane. I don't know how you do that. <laughs> I, I don't know. I mean, I know we know that some of the uh, judges or prosecutors are into making new law. That would be interesting. Well, yeah. I mean, uh, why not, right? Ah, l- ah, call it a RICO conspiracy. Mm. The owner is part of the RICO because he knows that bad people come into his store. Yeah, the the store owners are I'm responsible to... for attracting the crime and are clearly doing nothing about it. I guess he's Yeah, the stores are selling cigarettes and the gang members come in for cigarettes. Right. And so you sue the store owner for damaging the lungs of the gang members who come in and buy the cigarettes. Right. <laughs> God. Occasionally uh, you'll hear these stories of uh, store owners, convenience store owners, only allowing one or two people in at a time. Mm-hmm. And they'll do it often in school zones because they don't want a bunch of kids in the store at the same time. So two people at a time, whatever. I haven't seen that in a long time. But it's happened. And you think to yourself, what could a store owner do? No cash business, so we don't accept cash, only credit cards, which cost the store owner. Yeah. Um, lock the door. You have to come to the window, which, by the way, I've seen this actually, uh, where after hours they do this. You come to the window, tell them what you want. They grab it for you, bring it back to the window. You don't go inside. And they have, like, it's almost like a bank teller's window. So you buy a soda, they just drop it in the little bin there after they take your card. It's, you know, this is the ridiculous nature of the liberal mind. We'll just go after where the the people who own the properties, where the crime is happening. Why don't you go after homeowners, too, when somebody breaks in? How dare you have things that people want? <laughs> How dare you keep your property so nice that people want to break in thinking you have nice uh-huh. things? The charge will be class warfare. Right. So it'll be lawfare on class warfare. Right. This it's, is it's how a, it's this is how insane they are. Don't go after the criminals. Don't punish them. Bail reform. We won't go after them. Hey, Bragg even floated the idea of if you use a gun yeah. in the commission of a robbery, but don't actually shoot anybody, we won't add a felony charge to it. Right. It'll just be a misdemeanor. <laughs> this is how they think. Oh, my God. <laughs> Oh, and people are scrambling, you know, and then and then these idiots <laughs> say things like, well, there's just a perception that that crime is up. In our town. No. If we just quit talking about the facts. You've got a problem. And the source of your problem is the criminal element. Go after it. Take it down. And punish it severely. I did a lot of research on that, by the way, Gary. I spent years researching <laughs> what should be done in situations like this. You grapple talking, with it. I grapple. grapple I, I, I was thinking about building my own grappling room. <laughs> I grappled so hard with this. This is a simple equation. Yeah, we could it doesn't call, take much. We could call this the grappling room yeah. that we're in right now. Welcome. That's true. We're Red Eye Radio inside the grappling room. We're grappling about all the issues out there. Yeah. Because we are seasoned adults 
uh, who will only have an opinion if we believe it will get us political power. So yeah. we're always grappling over every issue. Right. <laughs> Cause... Uh, can I get a win on this? I can't? Okay, never mind. Then I don't believe that. <laughs> <laughs> then I believe something else. Oh, man. No way. Oh, well, but you 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 think about it because, you know, the whole the Don Staley thing is, is really amazing when you when you actually think about it. Now, from what I've seen, she hasn't responded at all. To any of the criticism. Right. Uh, I was playing before the the Sky News in Australia was all over it I mean, a huge segment on it going. What in the world is going on? <laughs> what in the world? Think about it. Because that's the accusation that she doesn't truly believe it. And she hasn't come out and said, yes, I do. Right. Because that almost almost every commentator in what Sage Steele said it, Raleigh Gaines said it, that's been the biggest accusation that she really doesn't believe it. But even in her position, she is afraid to say what she truly believes. Yeah. Yeah, she's intimidated by by something. Because you can't convince me that's what she really believes. I don't buy it. And I, because I would expect to hear the following day, this is what I believe, and yeah. you're not going to change. Nope. You didn't hear any conviction in her answer. Only hesitation. Yeah. That tells you everything. You think you'd prepare for that question? Well, I wouldn't have to prepare for it. I know what I believe. Yeah. It's pretty simple. And I, I don't need to grapple. I don't need to have the back and forth. You know, is And that you know what? If I'm in her position, I just went undefeated and got the championship. So anybody that wants to fire me, go ahead. But women should be playing women's sports, and that's the end of it. I asked you this question during the break, and I just said, I wonder if Pat Summit was alive, hmm. what her answer would have been. I can't imagine. I can't imagine Pat Summit hemming and hawing. Well, you know, I think there are areas where I, I can't imagine biological men should play against biological females. Yeah. I can't imagine that. No. And you think about it, so it's you. You think about it, you say, is it, is is it? Sh she was afraid because DEI is so strong in the college campuses and her campus. I'm I'm not saying this is the case. It's pure speculation. But she's afraid she could get fired for cause if she took the opposite opinion. Right. Well, you and know. just didn't don't doesn't want the hassle of it. But look. At some point in your life, as a damn adult, you gotta have an opinion. You gotta have strong opinions. Well, when do you not common sense opinions? When do you have leverage if you don't have it in the moment that you've gone undefeated and, and you've got the championship already behind you? You've got all the leverage no, it was in the a, world. It was before the championship. Was it before the game? Yeah, it was Saturday. Okay, the game was Sunday. All right, yeah. but they ultimately went undefeated. Oh yeah, yeah. So. Yeah. They won. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they did. All right. Yeah. You're going to fire her? Go ahead. You're going to fire her even more so before the big game? What are you going to do about it? You're going to fire her in front of the world for defending women's rights? The, the thing that was strange, though, is how she became a victim in her own mind. Mm -hmm. Oh, now people are going to be is, uh, you're talking about that and taking the focus off the game. You mean you can, well, you're the problem. You couldn't answer that simple question. But you're the one that interject. It's a very simple answer to deliver. Right. You cause, and by the way, if you believed it to be the case, you would have said that you would have said, no, if a man believes he's a woman and you would have said it just like that without hesitation, it took you way too long to get that answer finally just kind of lobbed out slowly way too long nobody buys that you believe that but if you do there's a tell we know we know it when we hear it 
It's called conviction. At any other time, almost in our history, if she would have, if Dawn Stilley would have done that, you would have had feminists come and say, this is how oppressive the patriarchy is in colleges today. Yeah. Right. That the sexism and the misogyny still continues and the intimidation of somebody like Dawn Staley. That's what you would have heard from feminists. Right. She can't tell you the truth. This is the old feminists. The feminists believe, you know, uh, and, and we don't include Gloria Steinem because she became one of the new feminists where feminism means the male defines a woman. Right. Now, we frankly don't understand it. We don't make the rules. We're not the rule makers here. The masculinist. Yes. We're the mascul- <laughs> That's what she is now. The masculinist. Yeah. You're not a feminist. Yeah. If you're not fighting for women's rights. Yeah. But that's the thing, because that's what you would expect. You would expect someone to come up for the defense of biological women in sports. Mm -hmm. And it's just and and the one of the things is uh, uh, you you think about Don. I mean, now it's being driven by women. Don Staley. Then there was a reporter in the you know USA Today. Right. She came out in favor. Yay, 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 yay. What the hell's going on with women? What happened with these what happened with these women who now claim that misogyny is a woman stating that she doesn't wish to play sports and or contact sports with a biological male? <laughs> How did that become misogyny? Yet here we are. Who said that the other day that it was uh who went after who was it went after Raleigh Gaines the other day? Mm, I forget. Eight six six ninety red eye. We'll be right back with more Red Eye Radio with Eric Harley and Gary McNamara. It's Red Eye Radio. Uh, he is Eric Carly, and I'm Gary McNamara. Uh, Biden and more student loan for, oh, excuse me, transfer, not forgiveness. There is no forgiveness. There is no cancellation of the uh, the loan. And also how fast the budget deficit is going up. Uh, the six-month report came out yesterday. The uh, six-month deficit, $1.1 trillion. Six months. Wow. Uh, the six months, the interest on the debt. Uh, now more than what we spend, the interest on the debt, uh, now more than we spend on the military. It's moving in on $1 trillion a year, interest on the debt alone. There we go. Wow. This is Red Eye Radio on Westwood One. Now, it's Red Eye Radio. Gary McNamara and Eric Harley talk about everything from politics to social issues and news of the day. Whether you're up late or you're just starting your day, welcome to the show. From the Uniden America Studios, this is Red Eye Radio. All across America and around the world, we are Red Eye Radio. <laughs> He's there, Curly, and I'm Gary McNamara. No, you're making all good points. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to just uh, talking about, because you see the advertisements uh, out there for, mm-hmm. uh, for Trump, and basically he's got all the presidents lined up before him saying, you know, every one of these presidents was in a war and... You know, I wasn't right, and you you're we we're just having this discussion. You just said, you know, really, Trump is parroting what you got from the left fifteen years ago. The left and the left and, w- and and libertarian slash left, because you and I kind of dealt with that. <clears throat> we remember uh, back with when uh, Ron Paul was running, 
And it it is the, hey, these countries need to handle their own skirmishes. And they need to, you know, we need to get out of it. We need to not get into it. And Trump being having that non-war president mindset and so far record is exactly what the left had been screaming about. Screaming about, about, yeah. For years. Well, it's, it's, it's sort of like, remember... Uh, what did we fight all our wars for? Oil. And now we don't have to. Right. And now they don't want to produce it. Exactly. They want They want to be dependent right. on the countries and the left. And this is where, and I know if you're if you're young, you may not remember this. Right. But the Democrats used to scream that the only reason we're fighting wars is for oil. Right. We need to invite some of those young people into the grappling room and have a discussion here because... <laughs> Come on into the grappling room. That sounds like a damn house of horrors. I know. Do you right? have grappling hooks? <laughs> hey, some old guys asked me if I wanted to grapple. I didn't think it was a good idea. Um, <laughs> I said no. But, <laughs> but you know, it, it, and it is, honestly... The bubble of today is dangerous in in that, and I know it's always been the case to some extent, but the, you, you hit on something, and that is you may not be aware of these things because you're younger. Yeah. And it's why, you know, we talked about it recently. You know, people say to me, well, how do you know so many things? It's like, yeah, just wait a few years. <laughs> you, once you've been around, you know, you're just going to know more things. You're just going to see more things. You just got to pay attention just a little bit. I had somebody ask me that the other day. You know, how do you guys how do you guys do that? And I said, well, it's the probably the thirty thousand hour thing from David Lee Roth. And yeah, we're up around forty thousand, right? Over forty thousand hours now, so it just sort of becomes who you are. And I said, but, and I don't know whether this is accurate to the number or not, but I've always said. Actually, there are just roughly 200 topics in talk radio. Yeah. And so when a particular topic comes up, it's like you've done it seven times before. You simply put in a new date and a new person's name in there. Right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and, then, and, and then you're set to go. And there you are. And it's, you know, it is interesting because that's, a, it, and it's, it, there's a couple of things. It is generational because... You know, the Afghanistan, we, you know, we, uh, anytime we bring it up, of course, we have to acknowledge the botched exit of Afghanistan, but uh, the war in Iraq, uh, then Afghanistan and, and all of this. And, and that was kind of the mindset. Hey, we need to quit going to all these wars, going to all these places for oil and everything else. Mm-hmm. Well, then, you know, as that kind of faded away, then there were new generations of voters. You know, there was a new generation of voters who, really weren't part of that you know and but yet they're still you know uh, very much in the anti-war you know crowd and the left has been you know pushing for this and was you know pushing this for this for the longest time we don't need to go go to all these places uh we're only doing it for the oil uh the cheney family benefits directly or whatever you remember that (laughs) You know, we know who's Halliburton. calling the shots. Exactly. Halliburton. Yeah. yeah. And now, now now Democrats would be on airplanes with Halliburton to go and develop oil in Venezuela. Well, uh, seriously, and, and not just oil, but lithium and everything else they, <laughs> they want for the EVs. We're not going to get that here at home for the most part. We're going to have to go to other countries. We're going to have to go to China. We're going to have to go to uh, other nations to get that with our handout. And, yeah, Biden is, you know, begging Venezuela. Yeah, That's the thing that is really incredible, and Democrats aren't upset about it at all. Right. And when you think about it, how many uh, – I, I go back, I mean, after – you know, you didn't hear it as much during Vietnam, but it was when we started having the gas crisis in 73, 74. Mm-hmm. You know, that, that's when it started, you know, the, 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 uh, the, the gas crisis. That's when it started, okay, uh, uh, you know, anything that happened – uh, after that, from from there all the way till, uh, you know what? Probably until we got out of Iraq. Yeah, everything you know from that time period, really from seventy three to probably what twenty ten, twenty eleven, twenty twelve. That was the narrative. Yeah, you know you're you're talking 
you know, almost 40 years, that was the narrative from the left constantly. Right. The only reason we fight wars is for oil. We need to be self-sufficient. So we got the ability to be self-sufficient, and the left has completely reversed itself. Right. And is begging foreign dictators to produce oil and whatever energy, whatever else they need, whatever raw materials they need, while domestically they're trying to stop it. They haven't succeeded right. with the oil business, but they're trying to stop it. They don't want to be self-sufficient. And we go begging to Saudi Arabia. We go begging to Venezuela. We go begging to our adversaries to provide us with the fuel that we need instead well, long- of having a national a national effort to produce everything here. Right. And how long before we're buying lithium from Afghanistan? They have, they have lithium fields. Well, you mean uh, the, the j- Taliban? So yeah, exactly. Just buy directly from the Taliban. Well, I mean, I think of the fall of Mosul, which lasted just under three years, and ISIS controlled Mosul, and Mosul being the center of the energy for for Iraq. Imagine that ISIS had still controlled Mosul. That 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 uh, Iraqi forces didn't, with the help of the U.S., having to go back in because of another, well, ultimately failed exit. Imagine they didn't regain control of Mosul and that ISIS still controlled Mosul, which would probably mean at this by this point they would control much, if not all, of Iraq. Well, you'd be at their door, you're at Venezuela's door, you're letting Iran in the game. That's a get, but that's a given. You're going to go to Afghanistan and tell them, tell the Taliban, hey, we want some of that lithium out of your lithium fields. I mean, you have to ask these questions. Uh, I don't believe we're ever, you know, the polls that showed after the botched exit of Afghanistan. Uh, more Americans looked at it and said, yeah, we probably should have left some troops there. And also the sentiment was, yeah, we probably will have to go back at some point. I I don't see that happening now. I don't think that's in the future. The fact of the matter is, given the behavior of this president, if he were to remain president, or who knows, maybe it happens between now and January 20th of next year, even if he doesn't win, he just, again, on bended knee to our would-be enemies, and our enemies saying, hey, we need more oil and lithium and anything else on the ground because we're banning all that stuff over here. I mean, it's just ludicrous behavior. And we talked about it then with Ron Paul and, and that wave of liberal libertarianism, if you want to call it that. And they latched on to Ron Paul in a big way because he was anti-war. And so we said, great. We have everything we we need here. If that's your if that's your reason, if that's the one big motivator for you, then uh, we can. In fact, we can uh, lessen the impact of then Ahmadinejad and Iran saying death to America. Hey, I know you folks in Michigan were chanting that, but he was first, and all of the le- all of the leadership. You know, there in Iran, you could every time they said something, the the global marketplace for oil just went bonkers. Well, when we become the kings, when we go after what's in the ground here, we control more of that and it lessens that effect greatly. And we talked about that. Nope, can't have it. Wind, solar, EVs. We need to commit. I mean, they went from. We need to be self-sufficient so we don't go to war right. over energy to proposing a energy system that will skyrocket the cost for the American consumer uh, and will, along with it, commit economic energy and national security suicide. Yep. They wish us to be vulnerable for a grid that can't work right with materials that come from our adversaries right it's pure insanity and i remember cuz you can go back i think it was 73 uh cuz i still remember when 
number one in 74, I worked actually at a gas station mm. when we had the, the first gas shortage and it was odd, even days and things like that. Mm. And, it, and it, back then everything was full service. There was no fill it up on your own. And I was working at a gas station for two weeks during that period of time. But I remember, uh, Probably one of the starts of it in Hollywood was Three Days of the Condor, if you remember that, mm. with Robert Redford. Mm-hmm. And that was a whole thing about the CIA. All of that was about oil. Right. And so that was when it really, you know, started, well, we need to get oil from elsewhere. We need to get it from out el- Because we did at that point. Right. We needed to, you know, get so much of our oil from the Middle East. We were so much more dependent on the Middle East. We don't need to be anymore. And it's just, it's amazing the switch, the evolution of the Democratic Party from a party that was saying, we need to be self-sufficient, produce it here, good American jobs, manufacturing jobs here. Yep. Uh, and then we then we control it. We don't need to be involved in all these different foreign wars. To the Democratic Party, absolute lock and step with the president out there begging mm-hmm. dictators to give us more oil. Yeah. And then just killing American jobs. And Democrats aren't. I will say this. No Democrats are upset. You know why I can say that? Mm. Because no Democrat has ever told me they're upset about it. Right. They're not. I've never got a Democrat saying I'm upset at the energy policy of the Democrats. No, we see it. They may be out there. They've never told it to me. Well, and you and you would you would see it more and more. I mean, remember the level that we saw it back then. It was everywhere. I mean, it was people were loud about it, you know, and. Okay, we said, all right, fine. If that's your position, okay, now here's the reality. Here's what we have in the ground available to us. Here's what we can control. And if you say we don't need to jump into every skirmish, all right. If that's your one thing, here's the one solution that gets us there. And they turned right around. And we, by the way, we were headed to that self-sufficient level in production at a pretty good pace. Can't have it. And it was like a light switch. All that went away. No talk about it. And, again, you know, you look at at, uh, at Trump's, you know, non-war president uh, record so far and the position that he has on those. And that comes right out of the playbook from the past that the left and populist and libertarian left was promoting and wanted. They were screaming about it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, well, let's, let's let everybody know though, in January of this year, even with the, the Biden administration trying to shut down, doing everything they can to shut down oil and natural gas on the leases that exist, Mm-hmm. They become so efficient yeah. uh, in their fracking mm-hmm. where we produced in January more barrels of oil per day on average than any country has ever produced in the history of the world. And we can do that consistently. Well, we can. We could probably double that. Mm-hmm. Yep. And have extreme uh, cheap energy here provide a- tens of thousands of New man, remember in the jobs report the other day, no manufacturing jobs created. Right, nothing. Uh, and I guess it was seventy one thousand government jobs. The majority of those government jobs were local. Right. Yeah, but still, they were government. They're government jobs. That's not government jobs is the cost of doing business. A right. government job does not equal a private sector job uh, in uh, the uh, positive economic uh, uh, factors that help the economy. You're not producing you're anything. Not, you're not producing. Wealth. You're not producing. You're part of the cost of doing business. Right. And, but yeah, it's just, you, you shake your head. You just can't believe that, you know, because we, we sat here for the longest time. Oh, yeah. All these wars are being fought over oil, 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 oil. That's got to be, I don't know. 25 out of my 35 years of doing, maybe 30 out of my 35 years Mm -hmm. of doing talk radio. Mm -hmm. Radio a total of 50 or over 40. Oh, we have 42 now. Wow. (laughs) 
and I'm only 16. Yeah, right. But, yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. We, we were just, just having that discussion. We just continued on the air. Right. We are having that discussion off the air. Right. It's like, you know, the stuff that Trump is promoting is the stuff that the left was crying for a few years back. And now it's some type of, of uh, I don't know, uh, conservative isolationism. Because I don't believe Trump's an isolationist. We saw that with Soleimani. He just wants to do well, things no, I, differently. I, I, I think it is about, okay, doing what you can do uh, to eliminate, you know, the threat. And it doesn't always mean sending troops over. He may be a that mo- was a bold yeah. move on Soleimani. Yeah, well, that was a massively bold move. Yep, it's like, well, fight a war a new way, kill the leaders. Yep, kill the leaders that are killing Americans. Eight six six ninety Red Eye. Brought to you by Hot Shot Secret. Hi, I'm Jen Loomis, a transport safety expert at JJ Keller, and I'm here to share a tip on roadside inspections. At a roadside inspection, inspectors may ask to see supporting documents. A supporting document is a document generated or received by a motor carrier in the normal course of business that can be used by law enforcement to verify a driver's logs. These documents can include bills of lading, itineraries, schedules, or equivalent documents that indicate the origin and destination of each trip. They can also include dispatch or trip records, expense receipts related to on-duty slash not driving periods, including receipts for meals, lodging, and fuel, electronic mobile communication transmitted through a fleet management system, and payroll records, settlement sheets, or equivalent documents that indicate payment to a driver. Drivers using paper logs must also keep toll receipts. Supporting documents must contain the driver's name, carrier assigned identification number or vehicle unit number that can be linked to the driver, the date, the name of the nearest city, town, or village, and the time. This tip was brought to you by J.J. Keller & Associates. Visit us at jjkeller.com. Coming up, more with Gary McNamara and Eric Harley. It's Red Eye Radio. It's Red Eye Radio. He is Eric Harley, and uh, I'm Gary McNamara. Coming up following the bottom of uh, the hour, there's a headline, Biden's latest lawless student loan forgiveness. He wants to write off hundreds of billions in student debt before the courts can stop him. We'll get to that, plus the latest on uh, the uh, the budget. Oh, man. Hmm. Six-month federal budget deficit, $1.1 trillion. Unreal. Was the I'm trying to see the interest on just the interest on the debt for six months, I think, was four hundred and forty billion dollars. Just the interest, just the interest on the debt. So that's closing in on one trillion dollars interest a year. Wow. About to trigger somebody right now. Gary McNamara and Eric Harley on Red Eye Radio. It's Red Eye Radio. He's Eric Harley and I'm Gary McNamara. Well, okay, you're talking about that, the editorial Biden's latest lawless student loan uh, uh, forgiveness mm-hmm. and the precedent that uh, that Biden is, is setting here mm-hmm. that he's trying to get something passed before the Supreme Court could even hear it. Everything right. is trying to, and, which, and they, they put in there that Trump could do the same thing to build a wall if he becomes president. Right. Well, yeah, but the difference is, is Trump now has public support to build a wall. <laughs> Much greater public support than he had in 2016 or, well, you know, in that first term. At least from Douglas Schoen, he does yeah. the Democrat operative, who has said, well, he's got to, they got to talk about building a, a uh, you know they got to talk about building a barrier and a wall. That's what Democrats need to do. A wall, right, right? Democrats need to propose a wall. Yeah. Well, that might make me wonder if I'm alive or dead if that ever happens. 
Democrats come out. We're for the hey, wall. We're wondering why the President Trump hasn't built a wall yeah, yet. Yeah. <laughs> what what happened? What happened to my brain? But this is uh, uh, where Biden again don't have all the specifics. Want to for, wants to forgive more student loans. Yeah, you know, you and I talked about this a long time ago because we both have debt and we both always believe that you're responsible for your debt. Mm-hmm. You know, we're it, when when you look at at some of the things that that we cherish in our constitutional system and the formation of this country. One of them is property rights. Right. Mm-hmm. Now, property rights doesn't mean just your pr- property is protected, but you do whatever you can to protect other people's property. Mm-hmm. And I mean not where you would defend your neighbor, which I would still be a good thing to do. I'm not saying don't defend your neighbor if your neighbor. But when you have a debt, and and I know you think this way and I think this way. You have an absolute obligation. That's your responsibility mm-hmm. to pay it back. Because if you don't respect that person's property rights, don't expect anybody to protect your property rights. Mm-hmm. And so that obligation when we take out a debt is this is mine to pay. However I have to pay it, it's mine. It's not anybody else's. I'm not looking for the government to say, Oh, uh, okay, uh, I want to get your vote. Uh, We're going to pay your bill for you. And I'm going to do it not as a congressional edict, but I'm going to find a way to do it before the courts can come in and say it's the wrong thing to do. Right. And that's what's happening. But you do have part of the reason this can happen is because people don't respect property rights. They respect their property, you know, And they want people to respect their property, but they don't respect other people's property rights. Yeah. And, you know, it's all great uh, when things are going your way, when they're proposing something that's going to benefit you. And then you turn the other cheek and say, yeah, well, you know, how this affects other people. You know, I'm not going to because we got that from a few callers when we talked about this whole uh, student loan transfer uh, time and time again. Uh, in this case, they're looking to essentially eliminate any interest that's built up to this point. And because for a lot of the programs, it was a compounding interest that built it up and people were complaining, well, it's building it up. You know, the, the principal amount that I owe is building up so fast because of the amount on top of it. It's a 20 year program. And so if you stay with the payments for 20 years then at some point they write it off. You don't actually ever have to pay that interest. Well, now they're looking at writing down the interest. (laughs) As Kramer said, they're just going to write it off and hope the courts, and we'll see what the details are with it, but essentially hope the courts are too late getting there. Because you could see the high court saying, well, You didn't have the authority to do this, but now the damage will be on the people who have these college loans if the government comes back and puts all that interest amount back on their account. That's seemingly what they're hoping for, and it's a bait and switch. They don't have the right to do this administratively, but they're going to do it anyway because Biden is desperate. He's desperate for young voters. And there is no canceling of the loans. There's no forgiveness of the loans. Nope. You're transferring the responsibility to pay it onto future generations because that just becomes part of our debt. Right. So the interest just keeps accumulating but has to be paid for by a bunch of other people. Right. Yeah, the, and, the White House says most borrowers won't even have to apply for loan relief Sometime before the November election, gee, how that works out, Mr. Biden will simply declare their debt forgiven. This is from the Wall Street Journal uh, editorial board. And we don't know how that is. They're they're kind of pointing out what we're pointing out, and we don't know the details. But they're just going to wave a magic wand here. And you don't get to do that. Because the American taxpayer is... The bank. We're the bank. Yeah, there is no government. No. 
government doesn't create, well, except when they print the dollar. But again, it's still, I saw somebody the other day, there was some meme that was saying, well, since we can print dollars, why do they have to tax us? Right. They just print money. Well, because they tax you, because you have to have productive dollars in the in the economic system. Right. And the money you earn is actually productive dollars. Right. If they just print the money, that's diluting the value of the dollar. Right. It's nothing more than monopoly. Yeah. The game. So, you know, it's just... But there is a lack of respect for other people's property rights here. We, you've seen it. I mean, there is there is a sense we've gotten the calls of definitely a sense of entitlement that my college loan should be paid off because somehow I was screwed over or I wasn't told the truth. Well, that's not my fault. Yeah, right. You're asking me to pay. And all these things that the president is doing is about shoring up his elite base to vote for him on the backs of poorer people. Mm -hmm. You see it here with the student loan forgiveness program. You see it with the EV mandate. Poor people aren't buying EVs. You're subsidizing so those that are much more well-off than you can have a car that they can virtue signal to everybody, I've got an electric vehicle. Right. The college loan. This is going to the people that have are going to college and have college degrees. And as Mike Rose said many times, why do we value the college the college loan as a loan we should pay off? Why don't we pay off business loans? Mm-hmm. Well, we've been saying that. What about the plumber down the street? He bought yeah. a, a truck. He bought $150,000 in equipment. He bought, he got loans for his, his business and he doesn't get to write off those loans, nor should he. But why wouldn't you in this case, my gosh, uh, if you reach a certain point on your mortgage, all is forgiven. Why is your college loan? Why is that any different than any other loan that people take out? Right. Right. If the government wants to have a program, especially a state government, where they say, look, uh, if you decide to take up this STEM, uh, you know, curriculum and you get a great job out of it, you know, we will reduce the amount that you want to pay because you have a productive job. Mm -hmm. Why would anybody, why should anyone pay for a gender studies degree? your gender studies degree. I mean, really, any degree they shouldn't, but I'm saying if some states, you know, for example, doctors, you've seen that. Mm -hmm. If you become a doctor in a rural area, you can get, you know, some, you know, whatever. Remember, they had it for teachers in some states, where if you become a teacher, you can write off some of the debt or whatever. Mm -hmm. But it's directly because these are jobs that are actually needed somewhere uh, in a society, so you get a break on it. This is just... We don't care what you. We don't care whether you're in trouble or not. Doesn't matter. Doesn't. These aren't just all people that are delinquent. It's everybody. Yeah. That's in that then the next group. It's everybody. Right. You could be making a million dollars a year and still paying your college loan off, uh, and it's like, oh, sorry, you're forgiven. Somebody else will pay for it. Right. And that's the thing that gets me. They believe the correct morality. Democrats believe, and the Biden administration believes. That the proper morality is if you sign a contract to do business with someone, and that's what you're doing when you take out a loan. And you take out a loan in order to get a good or service from it, you are the one that's obligated to pay it back. Not somebody who didn't take out the loan and not because a president wishes to get elected by bribing you to vote for him. Right. Because he's not going through the proper channels to do this. And you're not talking about the fact that these are all hardship loans. They're not. Well, (laughs) that's interesting because they point out the Wall Street Journal. They're expanding the definition of hardship. Hardship, of course. Right. 
Well, you're changing then the contract after the case. You're changing the rules on the fly. And again, there are two parties. The taxpayer's the lender. We're the bank. But we don't get any say-so in it. And when you come in and say, well, we're just going to do this and manipulate that, I mean, this is what they're hoping for. They're hoping by the time it gets to the high court that the high court will look at it and go, well, what's already done is done. The damage would be too great to come back and impose all of that debt, reimpose that debt back on these individuals. Because that's what it would be required if they were to get away with this. It would essentially, they write it off, then you, they're just going to write it off. And then you look at your balance, and there's your new balance, and then all of a sudden they come back and add a bunch to your balance. It seemed they were pretty uh, open on the bribe talk yesterday. Yeah. You know, we're, hey, we'll get this done before the election. No, they were. So we're going we're gonna to bribe you now. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I think they're that desperate for young people, yeah. for young voters. I think they're that desperate right now that they're just going to have to go out and just say it. Just say it. Property rights are so crucial for the survival of any republic. Yeah, sure. And the property rights include that when you have debt, that's your debt. Yep. You don't want anybody to pay it off. Right. Because it's your debt, Mm -hmm. and you understand that you want people to respect your property, you've got to respect their property, and that's part of paying them back. And so it's not, again, where uh, we have the belief that, well, if I can get mine paid off or go ahead and do it and I'm fine with it, I wouldn't be fine with it. It's my debt. Right. I took it. Right. The last thing I would ever do is take my debt and tell somebody else through the force of government that they have to pay what I personally agreed to do in a business transaction in a contract, you and I have signed many contracts before. Mm-hmm. Once we sign the contract, we abide by the terms of that contract. I'm about to sign another one with the IRS here in a few days. <laughs> I just did so. I just paid that yesterday. <laughs> but this is, the, it, it, here's the thing. That's part of the move on, you won't even need to apply for this. Right. In the, in, in the past, it was, okay, we're going to set up a website. Then we'll tell you when it's you're eligible to apply. And, nope, we're just going to ma- wave the magic wand. So nobody even gets, e- even those who might say, look, I don't agree with this. Even if I have the debt here, if th- this is my debt. I don't want to do this. I'm not going to apply for it. Too bad. It's gone. doesn't gone. exist anymore. They're going to wipe it away. Unlawfully. Well, I mean, it's as blatant of a br- political bribe as I've ever oh, seen. Oh, yeah. The oh, way yeah. they promoted it there's, And there's got to be more yep. coming down the uh, the pike this summer. 866-90-RED-EYE. Lines open for your calls. 866-90-RED-EYE on Red Eye Radio. It's Friday Radio. He's Eric Carly and I'm Gary McNamara. I was just taken back how blunt it was. It was like, wow, you're almost admitting this is a bribe. And don't worry, before the election, you may not have to do anything. You'll just be wiped out before the election. Take a move on this before the election, before the election. It's like, wow, was the message out there. I'm just going to, I'm going to break the law <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> before the Supreme Court can stop me. To transfer your student loan to somebody who didn't sign a contract to take it out. Yep. And then you'll vote for me. Yep. And I'll win. This is Red Eye Radio on Westwood One.